Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 as we continue uh, making our way through this epistle of Paul to the people in Galatia. As you turn there, just a reminder that you have the opportunity to, to sign up to be involved in our children's ministries. Encourage people to consider being a part of that. Galatians chapter 5, Paul has been talking about freedom, the freedom we have in Christ. And so what we're going to need to do is we're going to kind of read the, the first part of chapter 5, and then we're going to go down to verses 13 and 15, 13 through 15, and look at those verses and maybe a couple of verses beyond that to kind of help us understand the context. But pay especially close attention to verses 13 through 15, as that's what we're looking at this morning. So if you're able to, if you would stand with me in honor of God as we read his word together. And here's how Paul begins chapter 5, this last section of the book of Galatians. Paul says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if anyone accepts circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You're severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You've fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well who hindered you from obeying the truth. And then we go down to verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Verse 16, but I say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. You may be seated. May God encourage us through his word this morning. And let's let's pray. Father, we do ask your special grace on us as we uh, get ready to study your word more closely. We pray for your provision for our, our physical needs, we pray that you would continue to help us in, in the things we need physically. We think of uh, the, the farmers in our church and those who are dependent upon them, and, and we pray just for your special grace on them. And then we pray, Father, for our spiritual provisions. We would ask that you would be the all-sufficient provider for our, our souls. We pray that you'd give us all that we need for life and godliness in your word as we know you will. We trust you in that this morning. We pray it in your son Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin this morning by telling you a little bit of a a story. Uh, Once upon a time, there was a care group leader. And this care group leader had two men in in his care group, uh, Mr. Legalist and Mr. Lawless. Now, uh, Mr. Legalist, like uh, all the members of his legalist family, uh, had some struggles. He he believed, he said, that God was good and that God was gracious. And yet, as you looked at his life, you realized that his his life didn't reflect that. He, He did a lot of things. He attended church religiously, if you will. Uh, He went to Sunday school. Uh, Mr. Legalist was involved in in serving in children's church. He had two nursery rotations. Uh, Mr. Legalist was involved in in giving financially to the church. He was just, anytime there was a need, uh, Mr. Legalist was there there to step up and and help. And and yet, uh, Mr. Legalist didn't feel as though God, even though he believed that God was good and gracious, he wasn't sure that God was good and gracious to to him specifically. He he didn't feel as though God was was pleased with him. And he thought that if he he did some of these things, that that perhaps he could could feel that God was was pleased with him, and yet he didn't feel that way. And even though he was doing a lot of things, and the church was certainly blessed to have him in the church, uh, Mr. Legalist struggled with, with law with trying to, to do things in order to earn God's, God's pleasure, God's grace, God's favor. 
Now, and also in this care group, uh, this care group leader had uh, Mr. Lawless. And like all members of the Lawless family, uh, Mr. Lawless also struggled in some significant ways. You see, he too, if you asked him, he would say that he believed that God was, was good and that God was gracious. And yet his lifestyle betrayed that he didn't really believe that. Mr. Lawless, when you talked with him about his spiritual life, you found that he was, he was not really all that concerned with obedience to God. He was what you might call an antinomian. Antinomian means someone who's against the law. And so he said, you know, I'm no longer under the law, and so I, I don't have any sort of law that I need to be obedient to. And so he wasn't all that concerned about attending church. He wasn't all that concerned about being involved in other Christians' lives. His spiritual disciplines were embarrassingly weak. He didn't read his Bible. He didn't pray. He wasn't engaged in ministry to others. He didn't give to others. He didn't give to the church. Mr. Lawless was, was someone who was uh, under the impression that God's, God's moral laws didn't necessarily apply to him. He said, I'm free. Now, both Mr. Legalist and Mr. Lawless struggled to grow spiritually, and the care group leader recognized that. He realized that something wasn't right in both of their lives. And he and his wife were talking about it. He says, you know, what, what should I do here? And, and as they talked about it, he said, you know what, I, you know what I'm going to do? Here's what I'm going to do. Mr. Legalist is way too concerned about all of these rules, trying to do all these things. Mr. Lawless is, is not really concerned about any rules whatsoever. I'm going to do this. I'm going to tell Mr. Legalist, hey, you need to be more, a little bit more like Mr. Lawless. Lighten up, right? And I'm going to tell Mr. Lawless, you need to be a little bit more like Mr. Legalist. Here's some rules, Come to church more regularly. Get involved in serving. Step up. Do some things. And so he has that conversation. He talks to Mr. Legalist. Lighten up, man. Enjoy life. He talks to Mr. Lawless. Lighten up, bless. <laughs> Do some things. You know how it goes? It doesn't work. Right? I mean, Mr. Legalist, he lights, he lightens up a little bit, and yet he's still not growing in his walk with the Lord. Mr. Lawless, he starts doing some things. He's coming to church more regularly. He's giving more. He's involved. He, he, he does half a nursery rotation. But um, he's, still, he's still not growing in the Lord, right? He's still not experiencing growth in Christ. And the care group leader is kind of perplexed. He, he thought this would solve it. And he, he talks to one of his mentors, the mentor that he had in college. He said, look, this is what I did and this is what's happened. And his, and his, his mentor said, well, of course that didn't work. Of course that didn't work. Here's, here's why it didn't work. You see, you were under the impression that, that legalism is over here and lawlessness is over here, that these two things are kind of opposite, opposite problems, and that, that's, that's wrong thinking. You see, both legalism and lawlessness, they're, they're not opposites. They're actually the, the same root problem. Both the legalist and the antinomian, the, the person who's against the law, both of those people don't believe that God is good and God is gracious. And, and they're not opposites of one another. They're, they're the same root problem. Here's how Sinclair Ferguson puts it. There's only one genuine cure for legalism. And it's the same medicine the gospel prescribes for antinomianism, understanding and tasting union with Jesus Christ himself. And what this care group leader uh, comes to learn from his mentor is that the, the opposite of both lawlessness and, and legalism is grace. The grace that is found in union with Jesus Christ. And what both of these men needed was not antidotes that were found in, in the other. You know, you don't, Scripture never says, hey, the legalist needs to become more like a lawless person. A lawless person needs to become more legalistic. Both, both people need to find grace in union with Jesus Christ. Now, as we've been going through Galatians recently, maybe you see where I'm, we'll come back to Mr. Legalist and Mr. Lawless here in a little bit, but, but as we've been going through Galatians, some of you have struggled, right? Several of you have come to me and said, okay, okay, I, I, I understand that legalism is bad. I get that. I agree. Legalism, bad. But Daniel... <laughs> 
don't we want to be obedient? I mean, I, I get that we don't want to be obedient to earn God's, God's grace and God's favor, but don't we need to be motivated to be obedient? And if it's not obedience that earns me God's favor, what is happening when I'm obedient? And this is something that you've said and I've said in my heart as well. Isn't it better, like if I'm going to be either legalist or lawless, isn't legalism a little bit better because at least I'm being obedient? Here's, here's what I want us to see. Paul anticipates your concern. Paul addresses a misunderstanding of freedom. He says, look, it's true that a misunderstanding of freedom would not lead to obedience. And the, the, the person who's not right with God is going to say this, oh, hey, you're saying there's no law? No law, that sounds awesome. No law sounds awesome. I, I can indulge in all the things that God's pesky laws were keeping me from doing. But, but that understanding, that understanding is the sa- comes from the same heart, the heart of the legalist is found. It's not a right understanding. It's not a biblical understanding of freedom. Here's the main thing that I want us to grasp this morning. And we're going to talk about this in coming weeks as well. Biblical freedom, it doesn't lead to lawlessness. Freedom in Christ does not lead to lawlessness. In fact, freedom in Christ leads to fullness of obedience to God. True biblical freedom is not something that's going to lead us to lawlessness. True biblical freedom is going to lead us to fullness of obedience to God. And both the legalist and the lawless, the antinomian, struggles to understand that. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of walk through some truths. And, and some of them come from earlier parts of the text. The first couple come from earlier parts of the text. I'm going to walk through each of these truths to help us understand this this overarching truth that it's only, in fact, in freedom that I can find myself in fullness of obedience to God. Here's the first truth that I want us to look at together. Number one, number one, the first truth I want us to think about is this. I'm justified before God, not by my works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we're going to go through some of these, these first ones, hopefully a little bit more quickly. But, but you, you remember that, right? What does Paul say in uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 15? He says, he's talking to Peter there in that, that context. He says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And yet what? He says, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. He says, so we also, even as Jews, we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified before God, not by works of the law, but in order to be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. That's the core of the gospel message that Paul wants his readers to understand. How do we get justified? How are we declared righteous by God? We're declared righteous by God, not because we've done some things, not because we're obedient to the law, not because we've, we've been more obedient than someone else. We're justified only by faith in Jesus Christ. That's the core of the gospel message. We're declared righteous by God, not by our works, but through faith. And then that brings us to the second thing to think about as we think about these, these truths. Number two, what happens next we see? Number two, I'm united with Christ now. So I've, I've, I've become saved, I've become justified. I'm in relationship with God, not because of my works, but by God's grace, working through my faith. I respond to God in faith. I'm, I'm justified. Now I'm united with Christ. And now that I'm united with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but it's Jesus Christ who lives in me, and I live by faith in him. So in other words, I don't just get saved by faith, and, and now I need to start working. Now I'm united with Christ by faith, and it's, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me, and I live by faith in him. A couple of verse later, Paul says exactly that. In Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. In the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, both legalism and lawlessness are, are contrary to this understanding. You see that? The legalist who says, okay, I need, I need to work, I need to work, I need to work, I need to do, I need to do these things in order to find favor with God. That's a person who doesn't understand the gospel. The, the gospel is not about me working to earn God's grace. I, I've received God's grace I respond to God's grace by faith, and it's, faith itself is not a work. I'm responding to God's work. 
through my faith, and I, and I am justified, and then I continue in that life by faith. It's nothing I, I do. The legalist doesn't grasp that. The lawless person doesn't understand that. The lawless person doesn't, doesn't understand, look, I'm now united with Christ. It's not I who live, but because of this life-transforming gospel message, now I'm united with Christ. Christ lives in me. And this, this life that I'm living is not some life of, of lawlessness. It's a, a life of faith because God himself is residing within me. Both legalism and lawlessness are incompatible with the gospel. Christ resides within me. We're affected, right, by the the people who are around us. Uh, The kids, uh, a couple months ago, the kids in Whitney and I were watching some old home videos from like the the 1980s. And there in the 1980s, there's my mom and my dad and and there's me and my brother. And and when they they hear my mom and dad talk, the, the kids just start laughing because they said, man, your, your parents, were, they, they sound like Southerners. And I said, they are. And they, they just thought that was hilarious. And then, uh, then they heard me open my mouth on the video and they thought, oh, well, dad, you, uh, you know, and they had some, uh, very, um, in, in racially, not racially, uh, ethnically insensitive words to use about my accent and, um, not, terrible but you know what i'm saying and so uh, things about my southern in this now why did i why did i speak like that why is there kind of a tennessee or a texan twang uh, it's because of those people i was around you know and then i moved here to the midwest and and uh, i my speech became more midwesternized ho- hopefully a little bit i don't know it's hard to hear yourself talk but uh i keep the y'alls in there because it's such a wonderful word but uh otherwise you know we're affected by the people that we're around we sound like the people we think like the people we're around now if that's true just kind of generally on a human level how much more true is it if if what we say we believe is actually true that when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, God in his grace saves us. And we, we place our faith in Jesus Christ. And now God himself resides within us. How much more true is it that we're going to be changed by that reality? That God is living in us. I'm, I'm, I'm united with Christ. And now it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So... I. Follow, follow the line of thinking here as we go through the book of Galatians. I'm, I'm justified. I'm declared right before God, not by my works, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, now after that happens, I'm united with Christ. And, and now it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. I'm, I'm living the Christian life, united with Christ. Now, here's the third thing I want you to think about. Number three, now I'm free. I'm free. But I'm free to obey the law of Christ. Now, there's two things in that sentence I, I want you to, to think about. Two things I want us to explore. Number, number one is, is the word freedom. What does that word free mean? Remember a couple weeks ago as we were talking about freedom, we, we gave this, this definition. We, we, we said that freedom in Scripture means, means the removal of restraints. So in, in Scripture, when we talks about freedom, it talks about freedom from the world, freedom from sin, freedom from earthly powers, from the demonic realm. We're, we're free from those things. And then uh, John Piper, we talked about this definition that he gives of freedom. John Piper says this, full freedom, full freedom is what you have when no lack of opportunity, no lack of ability, no lack of desire prevents you from doing that which will make you happiest in a thousand years. Isn't that a beautiful definition? Full freedom is whenever those, those restraints are no longer on you, where you, you now have the ability, you now have the desire, you now have the opportunity to pursue those things that are going to bring you fullness of joy. And so now, because we've been justified, because we've been united with Christ, we're now free. You and I now have the freedom, the the removal of restraints, we now have the freedom to pursue those things that are going to bring us joy today, joy next week, joy in a thousand years, joy in a thousand thousand years, joy on into eternity. You and I now have that freedom. 
Now, the second thing in this statement is, is the second half of that sentence. We now have, the, uh, not yet, sorry, too early. We now have the freedom. You're not very good at reverse, are you? That's really tough. It's, I have no idea. I, I, I honest, I look through that program sometimes, and I'm like, I don't know how to edit it. It's terrible. Um, you're doing great. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> the, the second half of the sentence, I'm now free to do what? I'm now free to obey the law of Christ. I can do, what does it mean to obey the law of Christ? What does it mean to obey the law of Christ? Well, remember we talked about the law of Christ several months ago when we were in the Pentateuch, maybe a year or so ago. The law of Christ is the same thing as the law of love. You're, obe- you're being obedient to the law of Christ when you love. In some ways, the law of Christ is like the law of Moses, the Mosaic law. Both at their heart were all about love, love of God and love of neighbor. Love of God flows into love of neighbor. Verse 14 in Galatians here is going to talk about quoting Leviticus 19. But the law of Christ is different too. You know, I'm, I'm under the new covenant and I'm not a obligated to obey some specific rules and regulations of the mosaic covenant i now have the ability to be obedient in a new way because of this new heart and the extent of the the regulations that are on me are now greater there's no limits to the people i need to be uh, in a love relationship with <clears throat> paul would say this about the law of christ in first corinthians 9 let's listen to what paul says about the law of christ First of all, he talks about his freedom. He's, he's free from the Mosaic law. He says, for though I'm free from all, I'm, I'm free from restraints from all, I've made myself a servant or a slave to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those who are under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. So in other words, I, I, I submitted myself to some law in order to, to win the people who were under the law. And then to those who are outside the law, I became as one outside the law. And he says, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. So I'm, I'm no longer in the Mosaic law, but it's not like I'm, I've been remu- removed from all sense of, of law whatsoever. I'm, I'm still under the law of Christ. I still need to be obedient to God and the things he's instructed me to do. He says, I do this that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak, and so forth. So Paul says, I still have the obligation to be obedient to God. I'm still under what he calls the law of Christ. The law, as I said, the law of of love. For Paul, the, the the ultimate standard of obedience to the law of Christ is how loving I am. 1 Corinthians 13, he's going to talk about how the greatest of all things is love. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.5, he says, the aim of our charge is love. Colossians 3, he says, above all these things put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Philippians 1.9, he says, it's my prayer, he says to the people in Philippi, it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. You get the point? Love is a big deal. I kind of think of it like this. We talked about this when we were in Leviticus, I think. You have this, this overarching, eternal, moral law of God, right? And God's, God's moral law does not change. God is always just. He's always loving. He's always merciful. He's always holy, and he expresses that holiness in wrath. God God is always, his his eternal, his his character does not change. There's an eternal moral code that that always exists with God, and and that doesn't change either. And yet that, that moral law, that eternal moral law that God has, expresses itself in different ways at different times. So under the Mosaic law, People were supposed to be loving to one another. And some of the specific ways in which they loved one another, God, God codifies as this is what you're supposed to do. And he gave them the law. Well, now we're no longer under that law, right? And yet, it's not like we're free from any law. We're still under the law of Christ. And the law of Christ is God's eternal moral law expressed for, for the church for today. And the, the summation of, of that moral law is that you and I would love that we would love God, that we would love each other. 
I kind of think of it like this. Uh, I want my children to be safe. I want them to be careful. So I, I, I tell my children, be, be careful. But the way that that expresses itself is, is different for different children that I have. You know, my older children, I'm going to tell them, hey, when you're driving, you know, they're both uh, 16 or over. I say, okay, I want you to not be on your cell phone, don't speed, um, don't, uh, you know, don't drive on the sidewalks. Well, you know, those, those things. Be, be careful. Now, my younger two children are under 16. So I'm not going to say, hey, I want you to be careful. And when you're driving, wear your seatbelt. Don't drive on the sidewalks. No, I'm going to say, don't drive. <laughs> a 13 and a 14-year-old shouldn't be driving a car. 12 and 13, something like that. <laughs> Soon it'll be 13 or 14. As we, as we, as God expresses His moral law, there's it's it's God's law doesn't change, His desires doesn't change, His character doesn't change, and yet the way that it expresses itself changes in different contexts. You and I are now under the law of Christ, and we're free to obey it. Love's a big deal. It's a core action to which Paul calls the church in Christ. Now, here's the fourth thing. I can use my freedom, so I'm free. I'm now free. I've been justified, united with Christ. Now I'm free, free from restraints. I can now use my freedom in two ways. I can use it as an opportunity for the flesh, or I can use this freedom to serve others through love. That's what he's saying here in verse 13. He says, you are called to freedom, brothers. This is, this is what God called you to do. Now, here's the tension. This is what you're called to do to this freedom. That's why he begins for, uh, chapter 5, for freedom. Christ has set us free. You're free from restraint. Stand firm. Don't submit again to slavery. Don't become a legalist. So you're called to freedom, brothers. He's talking to Christians. But... Don't use your freedom. Don't use this removal from restraint wrongly. Don't have this, this warped perception that now you have an opportunity to indulge the flesh. We'll talk more about the flesh in the coming weeks, but uh, flesh essentially means the, the, our old identity in Adam in this context. It can also mean our physical body. And he says, you're called to freedom and you can either use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, or you can use it to, to serve one another through love. And that, that word serve means to enslave yourself. So the, the temptation that arises here is you're tempted to use this freedom to indulge selfish desires for, for the flesh. And instead, and here's kind, of the, here's kind of the crazy thing that Paul is saying. Paul says, don't do that. Don't. Don't use that freedom as an opportunity to indulge yourself. Instead, use your freedom to enslave yourself. You say, wait, what? Use the freedom you have to not be enslaved to enslave yourself. It seems very paradoxical. Paul, you're saying that because I've been removed from restraints, I should now willingly choose to enslave myself to other believers through, through my, he says, through love, uh, serve, enslave yourself to one another. It seems almost like, it seems like a bait and switch. Paul's been talking about you don't have to obey the law. You don't have to obey the law. You're free from the law. Free in Christ. It's awesome. Use your, you know, don't, don't submit to slavery. Now that you're free, enslave yourself. It seems like a very cruel bait and switch. Jeff Timms, uh, you know, whenever he was in seminary and attending our church, he, he told me, he said, sometimes, you know, a semester of seminary would end and it'd be a, a couple of weeks until the next semester of seminary would begin and they would be talking about, yeah, once you finish this semester, it's going to be so awesome. And then they'd get to the end, and the professor would say, and I want you to use, I want you to use these next four weeks to read these three books. And Jeff Timms said, yeah, I have a fake-cation. You know, it's not a real vacation. I was talking to our kids, uh, and they said, you know, uh, they were talking about the, the summer plans. And I think our children had envisioned some sort of, like, 
you know, total freedom, Lord of the Flies-esque uh, wonderland where there's no restraints. And I was talking to one of my sons. He's like, yeah, I have to read, mom wants me to read this book and you want me to do this. And, you know, uh, what about the freedom, dad? You know, what about this, 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 this world that I'd envisioned of, is that what Paul's doing? Freedom, freedom, freedom. No, just kidding, enslave yourself. What's the deal? Are we free just so we can be miserably enslaved again? Well, let's, let's look at two options. Here's the fifth thing I want you to think about. Number five, here's the fifth truth. Here's what Paul says. If, if I decide to do what Paul is telling me to do, if I say I'm going to ens- use my freedom, if I'm going to use my freedom to enslave myself to you, to love others, if I use my freedom to love others, I'm going to experience the joy of obedience. Look what Paul says. Paul says, the whole law, all of, all of God's law, I think specifically here, perhaps he's referring to the Mosaic law, is fulfilled in one word, one commandment. Again, this is Leviticus 19. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What would cause us to use the freedom we have to say, okay, I'm going to enslave myself instead of enjoying serving myself? That's, that's really the dilemma of the passage. And Paul is going to say, look, it's because freedom allows us to pursue our true joy, and true joy is found in obedience. Now, now let's think through a couple questions here. First question, how do I fulfill the law by loving? Paul says the whole law is fulfilled in one word, love your neighbor as yourself. How is that possible? Because, if you look at chapter 5, earlier it's been very clear, I, I can't, I can't fulfill the law. The law is impossible to bring about justification. Instead, I find here as I come to verse 14, the law is, fulfilling the law is the result of justification. Do you you see the difference there? I can't do the law and get to justification. It's only once I'm justified that then I can fulfill the law. And it's not me fulfilling the law. It's Christ in me fulfilling the law. In Christ, this is what I want you to see. How, how, does, how, how do I fulfill the law by loving? Because as I'm in Christ, remember all the kind of the, the steps we've gone through. I'm justified by faith, and I'm united with Christ, and I have freedom. So in Christ, not me, but in Christ, now I'm justified, and now I can do the essence of what the law requires. And what's the essence of what the law requires? Love. Now, in Christ, I have freedom. I have freedom to love others. In Christ, I can do the essence of what the law requires as I love. Here's what, here's what Paul says in Romans 13. Paul says in Romans 13, Owe no one anything except to love each other. The, the love that you and I have for one another is a love that, debt that never gets repaid. And then he just begins to describe it. He says, For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For all the commandments, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. So, how, how can I fulfill the law? Paul says I can fulfill the law by loving. Not me loving, but Christ in me. Another question that we, we look at as we think about this verse, how do I pursue this type of love? Okay, if I, Daniel, I'm, I'm supposed to fulfill the law by loving. It's Christ in me. What does that look like? What does that look like? There's so much that we could talk about in terms of loving one another. Let me just encourage you to think about uh, two passages here. And uh, both of them are in Romans. You can turn to Romans if you want. Romans chapter 13 is a passage we looked at a few months ago. I think in January. And, and what Paul is saying is, look, all, all, this, all the second half, especially of the Ten Commandments, can, can be fulfilled by simply loving one another. I'm not going to murder you if I love you. I'm not going to steal from you if I love you. If I'm sacrificially loving you. So how do I pursue this type of love? Two passages here, and I encourage you to meditate on two things. One, just the... First of all, the individual love that we need to have for one another. So as I think about living in this community, I'm, I'm loving you and you're loving that person, that person. So there's individual relationships in which we're all loving each other. And listen to what Paul says in Romans 13. He says, he's, uh, excuse me, this is Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 9. 
And uh, Paul says this, let love be genuine. And then he begins to describe what genuine love looks like. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. So so what does this mean? It means, first of all, as I think about using my freedom to love others, fulfilling the whole law of Christ, whole law of God. First of all, I think about this in terms of individual relationships. I put your needs above my own. I'm I'm rejoicing with you. I'm praying for you. I'm using the resources that God has given me, seeing them not as my own, but as as resources that ultimately belong to you. I'm I'm blessing you. In fact, he says, bless those who persecute you. Now, just, just think about that So much more we can meditate on, but but just think about that for a moment. What is the bar for blessing a person? In other words, for me to to bless you, to want good things to happen to you, the the, the bar is even those who are persecuting me. So you're, let's say that you're you're wanting bad things to happen to me, you're you're persecuting me, and my response is may, may God bless you, may God in his grace work wondrous things in your life. Now, if that's true, if, if that's the, the bar for the people who are persecuting me, what about people who are doing much less to me? What about the person who just kind of says something rude to me? What about the person who doesn't invite me to the party I wanted to be invited to? What, what about the person who slights me in some way? What about the person who, who speaks quickly to me or the person who, who I think is kind of unfair to me? What should my response be to those people? In my relationship with you, I recognize, and here's the other passage, we read it already, Romans 13, owe no one anything except to love each other. That means that there is an outstanding debt that I have to you to love you. I, I see myself as constantly indebted to you. There is no moment in time where I say, okay, you know what, um, I think I'm done. You know, I I think that I've done all I can to love you, and now I no longer have an outstanding debt to you. I remain, even when you persecute me, I remain in continual indebtedness to love you. Imagine if if you and I were talking one time and you said, Daniel, um, you are such a a wonderful person. I'm going to buy you a a new car, and you, you bought me a new car. And I said, my, how nice of you. Thank you. And then later we were going out to to dinner to to celebrate my new car, and I'm very excited about it, and we pay for the meal, and uh, eat the meal, and the the check for the meal comes, and the waiter hands us the receipt, and I look at it, and I say, okay, we're going to halves, right? Um, And you say, okay, fine, a little hurt. I say, oh, wait a minute, you had it, you had a Coke, And I just had water, so that doesn't sound very fair to me, right? 75 cents for you. How how crazy is that? That that idea of, you know what, uh, we're going to keep things even and and you owe me this. And when when you've done something so kind to me. Now, here's here's the reality. The reality is, is that Christ is in each of us who are believers, and because Christ is in you, my, my indebtedness to you is, is something that I can never even fathom paying back. And so there is a, because Christ is in you and my, my responsibility is to, to live with your relationship as Christ would live in a relationship with you, there, there's no moment where I can say, I no longer have any sort of relational obligation to you. I've, I've paid my love debt to you and now we can call it even Stephen. There's an individual way in which I am constantly indebted to you. I don't like what you did maybe at times. There's, there's need to confront sin. But Christ is in you and my debt is immeasurable. And if I use my freedom to love you, I'm going to experience the joy of obedience. Now there's also a corporate sense in which this is true. Think about this as well. So not only do I have an individual 
a sense of which I, I need to use this freedom that I have to love you. I need to say, okay, I'm free in Christ. I'm going to enslave myself that I serve you. Not only is that true individually, but it's also true corporately. It's also true in terms of, of, of this, the people who are in this room and the people who are not in this room right now who are part of Bethany Community Church. There is a, there is a God-given call to be obedient to the law of Christ by loving this church corporately. It means that I'm passionate about using my spiritual gift, gifts. Ephesians 4 talks about this reality in which Christ has given the church gifts. And then he says that we're to, to use these gifts to, to attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature, stature the fullness of Christ, so that the church can grow so that we can be a church from which the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body do what? Makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. We'll see this as well in Galatians 6.2 in a few weeks. There's a beautiful scene at the beginning of uh, Les Miserables, where in, in the book, where uh, Jean Valjean, this convicted thief, uh, goes to, and stays in the home of a, a bishop, and he's a the whole town has, has turned him out. They they know that he's a convicted criminal, and yet the the bishop opens his home to him and, and welcomes him in. And and uh, Jean Valjean says to him, you're, "You're good. You don't despise me." He hasn't said his name yet. You take me into your house. You light your candles for me. I haven't hid from you where I come from and how miserable I am. And listen to what the bishop says. The bishop, who was sitting near him, touched his hand gently. And said, you need not tell me who you are. This is not my house. It is the house of Christ. It does not ask any comer whether he has a name, but whether he has an affliction. You are suffering. You're hungry and thirsty. Be welcome. And do not thank me, do not tell me that I, I take you into my house. This is the home of no man except him who needs an asylum. I tell you who are a traveler that you are more at home here than I. Whatever is here is yours. What need have I to know your name besides before you told me I knew your name? And the man opened his eyes and said, really you knew my name? Yes, answered the bishop, your name is my brother. Brothers and sisters, that is freedom. My freedom allows me in Christ to obey the law of Christ and to say, okay, I, I, all that I have belongs to those who are weak, who are, who are hungry physically and spiritually, and, and now I have the ability to experience the joy of obedience, of, of laying down my life and enslaving myself for your good, for your eternal benefit and glory. That is, that is my privilege and joy, and it's, it's, going, it's only going to be as I, I engage in that ministry and the freedom that I have in Christ that I experience the joyness of the fullness of life that God would desire me to have. Will you this morning commit with me as a church to enslave yourself to one another? Are you willing to take up the mantle of our Lord Jesus Christ and serve one another? Are you willing to be wronged? Are you willing to be hurt? Are you willing to put others' preferences above your own? Are you willing to believe the best in one another? Are you willing to say, I'm, I'm committing to lay down my life for the needs of my brother and sister? Sixth truth here. Sixth truth. As we think about how fullness of obedience is only found, uh, freedom leads to fullness of obedience. Number six, if I use my freedom to love myself... If, if I choose wrongly to use my freedom to love myself, I'm going to experience the pain. The pain of destroying myself and others. Here's where this type of freedom leads to. He says, if you bite and devour one another, in other words, if, if, you, if you fulfill the desires of the flesh, if you use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, for, for self-love and self, uh, self-worship, self 
Here's the result. First of all, it's going to be active destruction. The, the, the picture here is of, of animals tearing each other up. And, and false teachers and selfishness does this. I, I gossip and I slander and I hurt others in my supposed freedom. And, and, and in reality, I've, I've enslaved myself even further to sin. And, and this type of conduct tears a church and others apart. Or maybe I use, I use my freedom for the passive destruction of others. I use my freedom, as, as Paul mentioned in Romans, without regard to what's best for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm, I'm passive in my obedience. I'm, I'm, I'm Mr. Lawless. and I, I don't see that as, the, as a desire and as an obligation to open my home and my heart to other believers. And I destroy the church and I destroy myself and my selfishness. There's a book that uh, one of my mentors, uh, Rocky Wyatt, gave to me. The name of the book is Well-Intentioned Dragons. He gave it to me right as I entered ministry. And he said, uh, read this. It's, it's more true than you want to believe. <laughs> well-intentioned dragons. The name means that there are going to be dragons in the church and they're going to be well-intentioned and yet in their good intentions they're going to end up harming you and, and others. And the book talks. It begins by talking about different uh, dragons, different uh, types of people you're going to find in the church. It says there's going to be the bird dog, the bird dog always willing to point out what others should be doing, the wet blanket, here's what's wrong with everything, uh, the fickle financier, the, the person who, if they don't like something the church is doing, talks about, well, this is too expensive, the busy buddy, uh, the, the sniper, the sniper is a person who kind of quietly goes along saying, hey, if, be sure to pray for our Sure, pray for our pastor. He sure is struggling with something, you know. Uh, the merchant of muck, the merchant of muck, always talking about what's wrong with the church. Here's what's wrong with the church. Here's what's wrong with the church. And the, the book says that the greatest danger done by dragons is not their direct opposition. It's more intangible. They, they sap energy and strength. They discourage. They destroy enthusiasm. They destroy unity. Now, uh, even now, 20 years later, when I read the book, it, like I, I looked at it this week, and it literally caused my stomach just to, you know, oh, just reading it's story after story of how this happens, right? And well-intentioned people destroying a church. It, it's terrible. Bad, bad, bad. And ultimately, the root issue is, is a lack of love. It's, peop it's just story after story of people who are not obeying the law of Christ and loving. But here's what I was... I was struck by as I read it again this, this last week or kind of flipped through it. You know, the bird dog, the financier, the, like th that, those are all bad things. But here's, here's the, the danger. The, the danger is that I'm potentially the dragon. The danger is that you're potentially the dragon. The moment I take my eyes off of serving you and think about the wounds that I'm receiving, I become the dragon. I become the devourer. As I, I'm more concerned about what others are doing to me than, than about my obligation to enslave myself to you. Brothers and sisters, let's reject the pursuit of the flesh. Let's not abuse our freedom. Yes, we're under a law, and, and we're, and we're, but we're not under a law. Of, of course, it says our salvation is dependent, dependent upon serving one another. But if we're in Christ, we should recognize I, I have a, an ability now to enslave myself for your benefit and for my joy and it's only there that the fullness of freedom is going to be found. Mr. Legalist and Mr. Lawless uh, were approached again by their care group leader and this time the care group leader didn't say okay you need to become a little bit more lawless lighten up a little bit sin a little bit he didn't tell the lawless person hey here's eight rules to obey he said look both of you I love you and I want to point you to the joy of union with Christ. For the legalist, this, this means you don't have to, to find fullness of joy in the obedience itself. In other words, you don't have to earn God's grace in your obedience. The, the joy is found in the person of Christ. And as you come to Christ and experience his beauty and his transforming grace, that's where joy is found. And he tells the lawless person, you don't have to fear that God's commandments are, are from a God who doesn't love you, isn't gracious. These commandments are not given to you to burden you with, with lack of joy, but to give you fullness of joy. As we look at freedom in Scripture, we're going to continue to see this. Freedom is, does not lead to lawlessness, but freedom leads to the fullness of obedience as I enslave myself to love you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the joy that we have.
in our relationship with your son, Jesus, we pray that through your grace, we would experience the joy of walking with you. We pray for the relationships in this church, Father, where there is lack of love. We pray that you would cause us to repent and with greater fervor serve one another. Not because of who we are in and of ourselves, but because you are in us. And we see in our brother and sister you, by your grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.